Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Zelia Warman, and I'm a program manager at Seven Bridges. Um, I am joined by Rowan Beck, a community engagement manager at Seven Bridges as well. We both work on the Cancer Genomics Cloud on the CGC, and today's webinar will be we'll be showing you applications and workflows on the CGC, um, an update on the available pipelines and how to run uh, GWAS in the cloud. Um, we will briefly do an overview of the CGC for those of you who are new and some key features. Uh, some of the applications we have available, as well as a demonstration uh, using the platform on how to run a GWAS um, in our platform. So uh, with, the, with the ease of sequencing and decrease of cost of uh, using bulk sequencing technologies, there has been an explosion of data uh, that's been generated by laboratories across the world. So this shows that not only um, uh, people are willing, are generating a lot of data, but they're also willing to share it and use it in their own research. So this fig figure shows the growth of gene bank sequencing and NCBI users um, and have been done using uh, releasing across the years. So over the years, we've had um, an increase in genomic, transcriptomic, proteomics, metabolomics, imaging data. Uh, it's grown so much that it's kind of daunting to think about how to find the data analyze it, and then generate my hypothesis or answer research question um, using it. So as a researcher or a student on their way to become one, it is important to think about the multiple dimensions of these biological properties when trying to answer your question. So um, one way that you access these data sets is through a cloud platform like the CGC. The Cancer Genomics Cloud is powered by Seven Bridges and is a cloud platform that allows you to analyze cancer data and where it lives. Um, it uses the computational speed of the cloud, which means that an analysis that could usually take you one weekend to run in your computer could be completely um, could be completed in ten minutes in the cloud. So this provide we provide a powerful yet easy interface to empower cancer research to draw new insights from petabyte of scale data. We have access to more than three petabytes of data uh, through the CGC. Um, then they are currently being accessed for more than from by more than seven thousand users. So these users that have in total uh, built 80,000 workflows um, and utilized fifteen hundred years of computation using the CGC. The CGC is stable, secure, and highly customizable. Um, and provides a computing platform with access more than, to more than seven hundred tools and workflows that can be com combined in several different ways. So our tools and workflows are gonna be really the focus of our webinar today. Um, but I also wanted to highlight that the CGC is part of a larger ecosystem called the NCI Cancer Research Data Commons, um, the diagram that you can see on the right of my screen. The CRDC uh, is a cloud-based cloud data science infrastructure that provides secure access to a large comprehensive and expanding collection of cancer research data, um, which includes proteomic, genomic, uh, integrated canine, and imaging data, as you can see inside the cloud. Uh, the CGC is one of the NCI cloud resources highlighted in the red circle that provides access to the CRDC data on uh, the several nodes inside the cloud in, the, in this little diagram, um, but also provides the analytical tools that are our focus of our webinar today to analyze all this data. So um, the CGC, like I said, provide access, provides access to pub public data um, just using the, the internet. Uh, several of these data sets highlighted in the, in the graph, such as TCGA, CPTAC, Target, ICGC, et cetera, are, can be used, um, can be accessed through the CGC and are part of the CRDC ecosystem. So as the CRDC ecosystem grew, the CGC grew with it and aims to provide a user-friendly portal for uh, users that are not as familiar with the coding um, or programming languages to use this, this platform and this data that is publicly available to them. Uh, our portal provides an easy way to collaborate in real time. Uh, Rowan will show you uh, during the demo portion how to add a collaborator, um, very easy way to add someone using their email address. So if you are um, if you are sharing data with um, or results or analysis with your collaborator that is in a different country, all you need is to have their email address and you'll be able to share um, your data in real time. Uh, so we also provide reproducible tools that you can execute and edit uh, to match your research needs. So um, these tools are highly reproducible and you can uh, edit them if we don't have the kind of tool that you need or the workflow that you need. You can also connect your own private data 
uh, via cloud volumes or drag and drop from your computer. So uh, some of the researchers attending the, this webinar, you may have um, may or may be thinking, I don't necessarily want to use public data, but I have all this data that I've generated in my lab and I would like to try out the cloud. We have various methods that you can import your data to the CGC um, very, very easily. So you can analyze it um, in the uh, in CGC. We also provide an interactive way of, of analyzing data through our custom uh, tertiary analysis directly in the cloud using R and, uh, and Python tools. So this essentially would be like running um, R in your own computer, but you run it in the cloud, which makes it a lot faster, which because it takes um, the advantage of the power of the, of the cloud computing speed. Uh, to this date, the CGC has been used in more than 90 publications from our collaborators, users, and our own team. Uh, and some of the, the publications are highlighted here in this slide. I'm happy to talk about them um, more after our presentation during the Q&A session. Um, I also wanted to highlight that um, some of these collaborators have also presented in the CGC webinar. And so if you're interested in their research and uh, how they have used the CGC in their own uh, laboratories, you can watch them on the recording webinar of the previous webinars. So um, for the new users that might be attending, briefly, you can just log in with your email uh, by creating an account, or you can log in with your ERA comments uh, to access control data that you've had pre previously approved for. Um, every new user gets $300 of pilot funding to start your project and just um, get started in exploring the, the CGC. For reference, a typical analysis can be done with the pilot credits and some of the analysis we're gonna talk about today were done with pilot credits as well. So um, you don't need to worry about costs. And if you have a larger project in mind, uh, we also have collaborative grants uh, you can apply for um, of up to $10,000. Um, the NCI kindly provides these pilot funds as well as the collaborative grants to decrease the barriers of um, accessing and uh, using the cloud resource uh, from, to access data from the CRDC. So another way that we have contributed to the bear, to um, decreasing the barriers of adoption of the CGC and the cloud in general is by providing the analysis tools uh, for researchers uh, to do their research, but they may or may not have computational resources or expertise to run them. So today I'm going to highlight some of the new tools we have released um, in the past year, since January, 2021, and made available to anyone in the community. Um, these apps are all open source and they are available to browse. Um, if you want to just explore while I'm talking, um, you can go to cgc.spgenomics.com slash public slash apps and you will be able to see the 704 applications we have currently available. I'm sure as of the time you, are, you will watch this webinar later, we may have more, <laughs> but as of today, we have 704 applications. So since 2000 and January 2021, we have released 153 uh, new tools for, that are um, several different categories highlighted in this graph over here. As you can see, we have a wide breadth of categories of um, tools from um, omics, epigenetics, imaging, et cetera. So we have released dozens of uh, new utilities such as um, finding SRA data through our SRA toolkit workflow as well as um, if you have done a recent CRISPR experiment and you want to look for offsite mutations, we have uh, several tools that can do that. Um, we also have more than 60 tools for whole genome sequencing processing uh, and GWAS analysis from variant calling, um, filtering, FASTQ processing, and BEM files um, sorting and um, all of that. Um, as well as, sorry, uh, several new somatic callers that we're currently, um, that we're also adding to uh, frequently if you want to um, study somatic mutations in cancer, as well as um, gene expression and bulk RNA um, and signal cell RNA seq tools such as DexSeq and Surat. So, one example of these tools is Surat. Uh, the Surat is an R package. Um, that can be used to for clustering and detection of uh, marker cells to identify cell types. Um, the input file for this is a gene cell count matrix produced from our regular single cell quantification tool. Uh, in the image, you can clearly see eight different cell clusters, uh, some of which are representing subclusters of larger clusters. 
And um, for this graph, we use the publicly available um, data, uh, mono, mono nuclear cells uh, from healthy individual. Uh, and we were able to, were able to run 4,000 cents of cells analyzed in 10 minutes for under the 50, for 15 cents. So one, we can easily picture that you can use um, these tools for different purposes. And this graph might be, may look different for an individual with cancer. So this is one of the tools that we released in the, uh, in the, in the 2021. Uh, another set of categories of tools that we have released in the past year. Um, 11 uh, new long sequencing tools, including PacBio and ONT workflows to support long read sequencing. Uh, dozens of proteomics tools, including FragPipe, MaxPont, and Olink. 10 new uh, imaging and machine learning uh, tools that can um, analyze radiology and histochemistry images, and you can run machine learning in the cloud, as well as uh, six new epigenetics tools including the commonly referenced to the ENCODE project. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, some of the tools that we released are um, from ENCODE. So ENCODE um, has created a comprehensive catalog of segments of the human and mouse genomes uh, to enc that ENCODE for functional elements. Um, the ENCODE has generated thousands of experiments to characterize uh, how regulatory elements um, impact the functions in the, in the human and mouse genome, and they annotate functional elements across, um, across these populations of, of, of samples and cells. Um, they not only release this data, but they empower the scientific community to, to explore it. And they also um, provide the pipelines that they use to process their data. And so um, what we did is we adapted uh, the two ENCODE most broadly used pipelines to empower our own researchers to analyze their epigenetics uh, experiments in a similar way in a comparable fashion to, to ENCODE. So I don't want to scare you with how the complex this ENCODE chip seq pipeline is. So if you look at the graph over here, each little um, gray button is, a, um, is an input file. Each green dot is a uh, tool. And these were connected in several different ways um, by our, our, tool, our team of bioinformaticians and experts to recreate the pipeline that you can find on the ENCODE uh, webpage. So briefly, the steps of this six chip seq analysis workflow, um, it maps the reads um, and duplicates, um, including duplicate removal, cross-correlation analysis, peak calling, as well as uh, providing a statistical framework that allows you to use um, biological replicates to infer uh, and better um, specify and increase the specificity of peak calling. So if you're not as familiar with ChIP-seq, um, ChIP-seq basically looks at patterns of transcription factors and other proteins that bind to the DNA uh, and combines um, chromatin remodulus precipitation with standard next generation sequencing. So um, even though this is a completely, it's a very complex workflow um, and it looks kind of complicated. Uh, we also benchmarked it to make sure that our researchers were able to predict how much it would cost them to run a, a, um, a couple of samples like this. Uh, so taking into account two different replicates, uh, you can see that none of these uh, runs were more than $6 uh, for, for, for a sample. For example, we tested transcription factors, binding histone and different controls. So. It's important to note that these costs could even be further reduced by using spot instances, which is basically an on demand. Uh, if there's an instance that is free, you'd be able to access it at a lower cost instead of waiting for that one specific um, instance that you are looking for. Um, so one other thing that we usually want to do when we're looking at epigenomics and transcription factor binding sites is, okay, um, this transcription factor binds here, but what are the genes or potential genes that are affected by the binding of, um, of this transcription factor? How can I identify gene expression? And knowing that this is a common question, we also released this year this workflow that does joint analysis of attack seq or chip seq uh, with RNA seq data that looks for gene expression. So it starts with comparing the transcript count from the RNA seq and the PIXEC data to identify differential expressed genes, expressed genes and binding regions. So the, detect, the detected differential features are then overlapped and used for gene study enrichment analysis. So that way you can um, combine these two um, data sets 
and do a multi-omics analysis and identify potentially a gene pathway or um, a subset of genes that might be interested in looking at that might contribute to disease. Might contribute to disease. Um, so this was just a very brief overview of several of the of some of the applications we released this year. Um, these are belong to a larger public app, gaps gallery that has 700 applications. These apps, including the ones that I just mentioned, are optimized to run in the cloud. So they run incredibly efficiently and fast. As you saw, we could run 4,000 single cell <laughs> experiments in 10 minutes. Um, they are high quality and with a lot of documentation. So um, if you are not as familiar with using these tools, we have thorough documentation and we also provide some default parameters so you can run a subset of your samples and um, try it out. We also, uh, this, this um, tools, because they have been uh, optimized and looked at by our team of bioinformaticians, they do produce reproducible and portable results. Uh, we provide version control. So anytime we make a, um, an update on the app, we have different versions. So if a year from now you want to come to our public apps and you want to run your analysis again, but you don't want to use the app we have most recently used, you want to use version number I don't know, 2.0 instead of 5.0, you can do that. So you can obtain exactly the same results so you can replicate your data. Um, as we know, uh, particularly in a um, more virtual world, it's important to be able to go back, replicate and like share your data with people that are um, further away. So um, we also provide benchmarking as you saw to help predict the cost of an analysis. So that way um, you know exactly what to expect. So um, today I would like you, I would like to focus us on um, some apps that can be used for um, genome association studies uh, from input preparation to maybe for genes function. So some of those apps that I already mentioned could be used for you to um, look at a loci that was associated with a particular disease, identify if there's a particular transcription binding factor that is binding in that location and identify a gene of interest. Um, but uh, what I really wanted us to focus now is if we were to do a genome-wide association study or a GWAS, how could I use the CGC and the tools that are available there to run a pipeline from um, getting your sequencing data to having a Manhattan plot, the culmination of a GWAS um, um, using the CGC? So we'll walk you through some of the just regular steps of a GWAS, so to kind of get you framed on what usual steps are. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I can see something in my screen and I'm kind of getting confused, but never mind. So, um, and then after that, Rowan will show you how to actually do it uh, on, our, on our platform. So a genome-wide association study um, is designed to map polygenic architecture of common diseases by identifying genetic variants present in a significantly higher frequency in individuals um, with disease than the ones in the healthy population. So here on the left in the diagram, you can see an example where Halil C is more frequent in samples with cancer than the ones in the control. So that's the general idea. GWAS is a statistical approach that scans for many, many, many genomes and thousands of genetic variants to find those associated with a particular characteristic disease or trait. So um, they are incredibly effective in detecting common alleles that contribute to the inherent component, component of a common multi, multifactorial um, disease. This includes um, cancer, diabetes, hypertension. So these are complex disorders and the, the, the association you would find will be a small number, a small effect, but um, can contribute to the, to the inherited part of that, um, of that disorder. So over the years, GWAS have grown significantly, not only in size, but the number of diseases that were um, uh, tested. Um, and there's numbers, uh, thousands and thousands of them that have been published uh, and are available on a GWAS catalog. Um, you can look at them uh, online. So um, however, uh, usually the, the alleles identified by this approach have modest effect sizes and they cannot fully account for disease susceptibility. So in my view, GWAS are usually the beginning of an analysis to answer your question. Uh, just helps you narrow down a region of the genome that might contribute to disease or um, to the trait that you're, you're studying for functional follow-up afterwards. So there are several different pipelines um, that can run that to run a GWAS, um, but generally um, the data is collected from a study or available um, genetic phenotypic information. This can be found in repositories of publicly available data 
such as it's found in the gastronomics cloud or other um, ecosystems. Uh, the genotypic data can then be collected using various methods like microarrays, whole genome sequencing, or uh, whole exome sequencing. Uh, currently, whole genome sequencing is the most commonly used uh, technology as it provides an unbiased way to collect common variants occurring in the population and the sets of samples that you selected. Um, after you've um, after you've genotyped and identified and performed all the sequencing, you do a number of quality of control steps. Um, these are needed for identifying potentially bad SNPs that were from poor sequencing, detection of uh, population stratification in a sample, or calculation of the principal components. So this figure here in step number uh, C, um, the figure shows clustering of sequenced individuals that uh, are now clustered into according to their genetic ancestry. So this information will then be used to inform our model of relatedness levels between samples to try to decrease uh, false positives um, in our null model and association test. So then this next step is to perform imputation of, um, of data where genotypic data can be phased using uh, repositories such as the Thousand Genomes Project or TopMed. Uh, Rowan will walk you a little bit through more about uh, how to do this with uh, Geo or the Thousand Genomes Project, but uh, in general, um, this example shows SNP1 and SNP2, SNP3 actually being used, uh, being imputed based on uh, the Thousand Genomes Project data. So you can use information from the Thousand Genomes Project to determine um, um, the SNPs that you did not cover. Uh, finally, the, the next step is to run the genetic association tests uh, for each genetic variant using an appropriate model. So each genetic variant is going to be tested for potential association with, um, with the disease. We will use today a single variant as association testing model. We will correct for population stratification and multiple testing and generate an output of a plot that looks like this. This is our Manhattan plot that everyone is uh, used to seeing in, uh, in publications. Um, after we do our association testing, uh, the results can be um, can be uh, combined with other uh, similar uh, GWAS by to increase sample size. It can they can be replicated um, to ensure that the the low size is not dependent on the population. Um, and after the GWAS, like I said, uh, it's important to do post GWAS analysis to, to explore the loci that were associated with a specific disease, either by pinpointing specifically um, which gene or a region of the genome that might be uh, functional. So despite of the success of GWAS, actually, the clinical insights that derived from their results have been limited. This is due to difficulty of interpreting um, GWAS associations. So this is due to linked variants. Uh, they are equally associated with the trait due to linkage to equilibrium. It's sometimes unclear which cell types are causal to the disease, and most GWAS variants, like I mentioned, fall may, may fall in non-coding regions of the genome, and so uh, it did not directly affect the coding sequence and may affect transcription binding sites. Um, this is why I was mentioning uh, the epigenetics tools and gene expression earlier because the CGC includes hundreds of tools that you can use um, that we just released and are combined with the other left with other tools that have been there for a lot longer to analysis on, do analysis on histone modification, DNA methylation, transcription binding sites, identifying differentially expressed genes or calculate tissue specific expression that you can then use um, to further, ex further explore your GWAS signal. So um, if all of these steps sound incredibly overwhelming, um, uh, it's too much data to collect and all of these co confounding uh, results and we have to correct for all these things and there's a lot of pipelines and steps. Um, this is where uh, optimized apps and optimized workflows from experts can really help make this analysis more attainable to non-experts. And so, um, like I promised earlier, we are going to walk you through some of the steps to do with GWAS. For example, we're going to start with sample preparation and genotypic and qualitative control. For example, one of the apps that we and tools that we released this year is from GATK, the Genomic Analysis Toolkit from the Broad Institute. Um, this, uh, app, these applications can be used to prepare and filter data from whole genome sequencing, and we um, are very useful for the genotyping and quality control um, step. 
for example, what we did was we turned one of the their tools, uh, we called it uh, the GATK generic germline short variant sample calling. This uses the haplotype caller app. Uh, the haplotype caller app is capable of calling STIPs and indels simultaneously via lo the local assembly. So this means that wherever the application, the app, uh, or there's calling here in the center of the of the screen, GATK haplotype caller finds a new variation. Instead of building on previously found data, it completely loses, misses all the information and reassembles everything. This allows for um, more accurate calling of regions that are usually complex, like indels, uh, to, that are traditionally missed or mis, um, uh, misidentified in, uh, in regular calling. So this tool can be added as a pre-processing step, form a single pipeline, and do it done um, in a parse per, per sample basis to ensure that they detect as much variation as possible. And it can be usually uh, regionally done with an unmapped BAM uh, from, a, from a whole genome sequencing uh, data. So after you've processed all of your, um, after you've received the data from sequencing, you can use uh, GATK haplotype caller and the generic germline short variant to prepare your genotypes and perform quality of control to then go and do the, the association testing on uh, for GWAS. The output of this uh, pipeline is a VCF to a VCF file that then Rowan will show you will be then turned into a different kind of file that will then be put into a, um, our GWAS analysis. And like I mentioned, we always perform uh, benchmarking on our new tools. Um, and it cost us um, around $5 and over two hours, a little bit over two hours to, uh, to run this analysis. So um, you can also add, be interested in adding um, structural variants in addition to SNPs and indels to your analysis. Um, for example, polymorphic transposable elements, inversion, and duplications. You can also use them in the analysis. We, you, we added uh, seven DELI tools um, that are used to detect uh, structural variation from whole genome sequencing. Uh, the output of these files is also a VCF that you can then merge with your GATK um, output from the previous slide and uh, capture as many variants as possible so that you can use in a GWAS. So if you can picture with me that you sequenced your data, you have pre, um, pre-analyzed it and cleaned it up, um, and you have the best set of variables that you can possibly get, not only that are good quality, but they encompass all of the variants that you are interested in looking at, we are then going to move to the next step. Right. The next step here would be phasing. We're not going to be showing you today. It's a little bit more complex, but we can also, I can also point you to some of the apps that we have, such as ShapeIt, that will help you go through this step uh, in the cloud. The next step we will show you is um, the association testing of step number E, or letter E, not number. Um, the letter that we, <laughs> the, the tool that we are going to be working on today is uh, Genesis. Genesis stands for Genetic Estimation of Inference and Structured Samples. And it's developed by the Transomics Precision of for Precision Medicine, Top Med, then that data for coordinating center at the University, University of Washington. So Gen uh, Genesis is an R package. It provides methods for working on genotypic data obtained from sequencing and microarray um, analysis. Uh, it has a robust ability to estimate and account for population and pedigree structure and implement linear models and different kinds of models, depending on the data that you have and what you are trying to test. So um, basically, Genesis has all the tools um, to make the steps that I just mentioned from, you know, you cleared up, you make sure you make sure that your, your variants are accurate. You have as many variants as you'd like. You are um, in, uh, studying structural and Poly uh, polymorphic SNPs. Um, now using Genesis, you can control for population stratification, which is this step number C. And you can also um, use, um, do, uh, uh, sorry, uh, do um, multiple testing correction. Sorry, that was. Um, so Rowan will then now show you today uh, how to use these tools. And if you remember correctly, I said that you would not need to do a lot of coding to run GWAS. Uh, and this is because the Seven Bridges team has collaborated with the top med, um, well, University of Washington DCC, to create these tools and make them into um, point and click uh, workflows in our platform. So 
they we turned it to the start package into a workflow that you can uh, use use um, in our platform. So Rowan will then demo on how um, uh, this, how you can do this, and you can um, imagine with me that we successfully ran a GWAS. And what I, what I wanted to finish my section on was actually bringing it back to our um, to our public apps and talking about a little bit how every analysis is unique and maybe maybe we don't have the exact workflow that you're looking for. Maybe you are thinking, oh, you know, I really do, they have ship seek, but I really want to do a tax seek. And sometimes they want to connect something different that we don't, they don't have. And that's really where our web composer comes in and can really answer that question. You can easily create your own workflow um, by connecting the, the applications that we have available. For example, um, here showcase the GATK, the green dot is our, are the tools, the um, gray dots are files, and you can see the, the, this unmapped BAM file being dragged and dropped as input to two different, um, to two different tools that were not previously connected. So if for some reason we don't have what you need uh, out of the box, you can build it very easily. And if you are not sure how to get started on that, you can always attend office hours where we are um, happy to answer your questions and help you um, help you uh, achieve your goals in your research using our tools. So um, in summary, I would like to um, just give a quick overview of what we talked about today. We have hundreds of tools for different research questions. Um, we continuously optimize and release new versions. So we're trying to be as much as up to date as possible. Uh, if there's a tool we don't currently have, but you would like to see and try it out in the cloud, please reach out to us. We're happy to help you. Uh, Put it in our coding language and, and an, our interpreter that will put it into the um, into our platform. Um, if there's one thing I would like you to take out away from this from this presentation is that not only it's fairly easy to use if you don't have uh, coding um, coding abilities yet, because um, everyone wants to learn something new. At least I do. Um, it is very easy to share with your collaborators what you're doing. Um, the data is just at the tip of your fingertips. If you have internet connection, you can just go to our portal and check it out. You can rerun your analysis um, if you want to run it yourself and then tell your student to run it for you again to make sure you got the same result. You can do that. You just share your project very simply and you can everyone can see each other's tasks. Um, it's very flexible to match the analysis needs. You can add your tools. You can talk to us. We are um, available 24-7, uh, 365. We, are, we have very thorough online documentation. But if you also prefer um, more personal interaction, we have office hours uh, that are on Tuesdays at 10 AM or Thursdays at 2 PM every week. So if you uh, need more information, you can always visit us at cancergenomicscloud.org. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions in the chat, uh, but first I'm going to let Rowan do her portion of the of the demonstration, where she will walk you through um, our platform as well as how to run a GWAS using Genesis in the cloud. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Hello, everyone. Give me just a sec, and I will share my screen, and we can start. Okay. Can you guys see everything up here? I'm assuming yes. <laughs> um, thank you for that intro on GWAS uh, via Genesis. So my name is Rowan. I'm going to walk you through just a few slides, and then we'll do a demo so I can show you just how easy it is to conduct using our platform. So the objective of today's uh, webinar is honestly just to learn how to use the CGC and the Genesis package tools to run a single variant association test. So we're not looking to become experts in GWAS necessarily, but just to learn how to explore what tools are available and how to conduct a single variant association test. Keep in mind, um, this tutorial was originally for a two to three day data workshop. So we have condensed it in just a few minutes. So uh, if you have any questions, again, reach out to us. We're happy to answer these to the best of our abilities. But um, so to move forward, I'm basically just going to give a recap of GWAS, and then we'll go over some specific components that we're going to be using, and then I will show you how to actually use them in real time. So to complete a GWAS study, as we learned earlier, essentially you just need a phenotype of interest. This could be anything from cancer, height, eye color, anything, and you'll need a genotype. 
So additional annotation information like groupings, weights, ancestry, kinship information are super useful to get a more accurate picture when you do your statistical association. From uh, just the veno, uh, genotype and phenotype, though, you can do uh, either a single variant association test or look for multiple variants that might be associated with the phenotype of interest. This discovery is usually um, then followed up with further analysis, either using wet lab approaches or some bioinformatic approaches. So for the demo today, we worked with collaborators at the University of Washington, and we've come up with a simple example that demonstrates both the genotype and phenotype information. So the data we'll be looking at today comes from the Open 1000 Genomes Project. So this is a catalog. It's a very large catalog, actually, of genetic data. And it was assembled with the goal of identifying frequently occurring variants. So it should be noted uh, that this data source has genotype information, but no phenotype. So for the demo today, we're incorporating some simulated phenotypes that have been provided by the collaborators. So to conduct a GWAS study, uh, essentially, it's just going to be these three steps. So the first one is to convert the data to the right format. The second step is to fit a null model. And then lastly, we're going to do some association testing. So we have specific apps for each of these steps. For the conversion, we have Genesis VCF to GDS. So uh, VCF stands for variant call format, and that's the format that the data originally exists in. We'll need to convert it to genomic data structures, or GDS. Um, that's just kind of an efficient way to um, extract and store the genotype information that we'll need for the rest of the pipeline. So then next, we'll need to create, or fit rather, a null model. Um, so the null hypothesis for any GWAS study is basically just that none of the variants have any association with the trait of interest. So we need to fit a model that represents this. And the null model includes trait, um, adjusting covariates like age and sex, and any kind of random effect matrices. Um, it won't include the genotypes, though, because that's what we're actually going to be trying to assess. So then the last step is the assessment. So we'll run a single variant association test. Um, this is a statistical analysis, and it uses our null model that we just created and assumes, again, that no variants are associated with the trait. And then we look for outliers to this. So there are some specific platform components that we're going to be using today. Um, first, let's just start with this kind of user flow for a GWAS demo. So I created this specifically for today's uh, webinar. Uh, the steps are as follows. Basically, you create a project. So you can create your own GWAS workspace or whatever workspace you want. And I'll show you how to do that. You're going to add data to this workspace. You'll add the three workflows um, from the public apps gallery. And then lastly, you'll run an association task. And then if we have time, we can dive into the results using our studio or any kind of data cruncher. So to clarify some things, um, when you create a project, that becomes kind of your repository or like a big folder of files and apps. So you can see the members of the project over on the right. Um, you'll see the analyses that were run on the bottom of the screen. I've created one for this GWAS demo, and I'll be showing you in just a few minutes. At the very top of the blue banner here, you'll see public apps. If you click on that, you can then search and type in Genesis to get the following three workflows. Um, you'll find, like they said, over 700 tools. There's many of them, but all you have to do is type Genesis, and you will get a few options. And then we will be using these three in particular, VCF to GDS, Genesis null model, and then single variant association testing. So the great, great thing about using our platform is everything is self-contained. So you can run your workflows, you can look at your analyses, and then you can look at the results without having to download things, move anything. You don't have to email results back and forth. You'll see on the right-hand side of the screen something called output settings, and you'll see there are two plots here, a Manhattan plot and a QQ plot. And then we even have the associated R data. So you can put that directly into R Studio and just kind of play around with it if you'd like. If you click on the interactive analysis button at the very top here, um, that will create an instance is what it's called. And that will be kind of an interactive um, instance of either R Studio or you can do Jupyter Lab Notebooks, whatever you really prefer. And again, you'll have access to any of the files or um, anything that was in the project that was generated. So with that, we can head to the website and get started with this. I'm going to just move things around on my screen so I can access everything. But once you log in, this is kind of what you will be able to see. So this is the home page. You'll see a list of projects on the left, uh, analyses that have been run on the right. Um, so what you'll want to do is click projects. 
and create a project. You can give it a name. I'll do GWAS demo May webinar. Uh, you can scroll down. I'm using my pilot funds to pay for this. Uh, keep in mind, anyone who does sign up with the CGC will get $300 worth of pilot credits. So that's more than enough to run uh, any of your analyses for the, at least to start with. From here, you can click create and you'll be taken to your new project. Adding members is as easy as clicking this and then typing in the person's name. I'll add Zelia here and I can change the permissions here. She can write, copy, execute. I can make her an admin. I think I'll leave it at this for now. This is a great uh, teaching tool as well. So you can allow students to copy projects or files over without actually modifying anything in the, the project. So lucky for you guys, I've actually already created a GWAS uh, project earlier. So over here, you'll see a GWAS project for this webinar. Um, this is not a public project yet. So really what that means is just that if you search for it in the public projects here at the top, you won't be able to find it. However, if you want to run this analysis or run or replicate any of my analyses, you can uh, let us know in the chat or shoot us an email. We'll get you access to this project so that you can try to work with the data that we already have. But anyway, in the project description, we have just some really basic information about the Genesis pipeline, how it works. We'll have some uh, steps here, like create your project, bring in the data, convert files, things like that. And then again, on the right-hand side, you'll see some of the analyses that I've already run. If you click the files tab, you'll have access here to all of the files that were used today. Um, click on apps to see that I have already preloaded the three that I talked about, BCF to GDS Converter, uh, the Genesis Null Model App, and then the Single Variant Association Testing App. And then what I like is you can see the tasks that have been run actually. So you can sort them by completed, by failed, whatever you'd like. And this gives you access to see what I've already done. So if you have to, you're trying to replicate something and you don't know exactly which files I use, you can use this as a reference. So if we are going back to our project, and I'm clicking the apps, and we want to, for instance, run this VCF to GDS converter. All I have to do is click run. I have to select a file, so it'll ask me which file I'd like to do. And then again, I can go back to my tasks here and double check which one I used, which is the subset chromosome one merged VCF. So I can search for that. I can search for just VCF to start with and see what comes up. And then we have it right here. So I select it, click save, and then I can click run. So I've already pre-run these so that we could look at the results together. So for this very first one, the idea is VCF to GDS conversion. So we start with a VCF file and then the output settings, you'll see a merged uh, .gds. So you'll know that it worked. Uh, for the second step, this is a little bit more complicated because there are more um, files to add. So this is to fit a null model. So you'll use the GDS uh, file from the previous step, and you'll add in some additional information, like um, some of the ancestry information that Zelia talked about earlier. So that will be found in the PC files and in the kinship data. Uh, again, all of these were provided by our collaborators at the University of Washington. So you can add certain covariates that you know might affect the model, these things like age, sex, the study that it was done in, uh, the various principal components. And then once you click run, um, it takes just a few minutes to run and you'll get a, several different outputs. So you'll see that many of these are HTML reports. So you can click and view them right in your browser. So this is an HTML report about our phenotype that was simulated. So that's height in this case. And you'll see uh, various histograms and other plots that just demonstrate height as divided by sex or other factors. Once you're ready to move on to the third step, um, again, you'll use that same GDS file. You'll add the null model that was generated from the previous step. And then again, the phenotype information, and then you'll see output settings. So once it's run, you'll get a Manhattan plot and a QQ plot, as well as associated R data. So I've already opened these in the browser so that you can see them. And this first plot is a Manhattan plot. And this shows the significance of the association between each variant on chromosome one and a phenotype. Again, our simulated phenotype was height in this case. So each dot represents a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP. 
And these SNPs are ordered on the x-axis according to their position in the genome. So that is just along here. Uh, the y-axis represents the strength of the association measured as a negative log 10 transformed p-value. So the higher the dot, the more significant the association is. The dashed line marks a genome-wide significance threshold of p is less than 5 times 10 to the minus 8, which is the unofficial kind of standard for GWAS studies. It's widely used in the field. So our next plot that was generated is a QQ plot or a quantile quantile plot. So this shows the distribution of expected p-values under the null model of no significance versus the observed p-values. So the expected negative log 10 transformed p-values are uh, plotted along the x-axis, and the observed value is uh, plotted against the y-axis to visualize the enrichment of the association signal. So the red line here basically represents the null hypothesis of no significant association. So deviation from the expectation under the null hypothesis, um, or the red line, is what you'd like to see if your variants are significantly associated. So this uh, deviation indicates the presence of either a true causal effect between your genotype and phenotype, or maybe some insufficiently corrected stratification. So now that we've run our GWAS, maybe you'd like to play around with some of the files or associated R data. So you can click anywhere within your project on interactive analysis, and you'll be taken to this page right here, actually. So here, I clicked on Data Cruncher already, and I have one running. It takes just a few minutes to run, so I already had it running in the background. Once you're here, you can click Open, and you'll see it's basically like having RStudio directly on your computer. Oops. From here, you can load uh, your workspace, and you can set your working directory to the um, project where your uh, files are. And you'll see there are some various things you can play around with. For instance, I loaded some PC data. So we can click view, and you can view in real time. Um, here's the PCA matrix. So from there, you can plot anything that seems interesting to you. Uh, PCA, let's do vectors to see what that looks like. And a plot is generated in real time over on the right hand side of the screen. So I believe that that is all the time we have for this interactive analysis portion. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, let us know in the chat or wherever else. Um, you can visit us at office hours. We have those twice a week, so Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m. on Tuesdays and 2 p.m. Thursdays, Eastern Standard Time. You can feel free to drop in and tell us that you really enjoyed this, or if you have any questions, feel free to email us or anything like that. We're here to help you, and we want people to use this platform and get their data analyzed. All right, thank you, Rowan. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. Um, first question we had uh, is someone that is uh, very interested in uh, associate in uh, studying um, Bardet Vital syndrome um, and would like to talk to someone and collaborate. Uh, and to that I say, shoot us an email. <laughs> We're always here to uh, talk about this. Uh, there, this is the two studies under Suviopathies in dbGaP. We are happy to help you get set up and run your analysis on the CGC. Um, um, Rowan, would you mind writing our emails in the chat while I answer the next question? Um, so the next question I had was, uh, <clears throat> to know uh, how an NCI or an IH person could um, need to use their credit card or pay as you go. Um, and the, my answer to you is uh, you can use a credit card or a, a PO number. Uh, it's very simple. We can also walk you through um, offline if you'd like. Um, our users, um, some of them are from the NIH, some of them are outside. Most of our users are external, um, but we do have NCI collaborators, uh, including you know, and other NIH um, that can uh, um, that use our platform and it's a pay-as-you-go model. And you basically just, it's like another any other service that you use at the NIH. Um, the next question I have, uh, consultant on music. Uh, someone would like more information on the QQ plot uh, that they posted up there. Sorry, I'm not unable, I am unable to show. Oh, I, 
don't think I have an answer for you. <laughs> I just uploaded your QQ plot and I'm not sure, but I'm sure we can figure it out together. Um, I don't currently have an answer. Rowan, did you, were you able to, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you but have our emails, like, I'm happy to help, but I, I, don't, I don't want to mislead you and give you an interpretation, interpretation that might be wrong. I do not know what that QQ plot means, um, but we can figure it out together. I also don't know what that means, but my first guess would be then to try and see what your fitted null model looks like first. So maybe plot that and make sure that that looks normal. And then, uh, I'm not sure, but we can work together to figure that out. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, are there any more questions that you want to ask us? Do. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, guess silence means no. Yes, this is recorded and it will be posted on the CG the Cancer Genomics Cloud website. Um, you can find it on our webinars. The this will be uploaded there in the next couple of days. You can rewatch it. And if there's something that was confusing or you need further clarification, um, like I said, we can always email us or attend office hours and we're happy to help. Um, if even if you don't have an account yet, we can still answer your question um, <laughs> during office hours. Yeah, there's links to office hours on our website. And again, it's a very casual environment. So you can just come in just to say hi. If you have any questions, we're happy to help you out. Um, you know, it's just like regular office hours you'd go to at a university. You just stop in. All right. Uh, we can do Zoom or we can do Google Meet. So our office hours, the link to it is Google Meet. However, if you just uh, email us and let us know, we can always set up a one-on-one -on -one consultation or whatever's convenient for you. We have Zoom, we have Google Meet, we use whatever. All right. Uh, can I ask a live question? Absolutely. Okay, great. My name is Amy Stone Lake. I'm with the Bioinformatics Training and Education Program in the NCI Center for Cancer Research. So I've been going to several of your, there have been several presentations lately in the two-day workshop on these resources. So I have questions about how to get uh, these resources made um, and how to get more intramural researchers working with these tools. Um, I just tried to send you email, but for some reason, both of those emails come up as incorrect emails. So I thought I'd just unmute myself and um, let you know I'd like to get in touch with you and talk to you more about bringing training for these resources to some of our intramural researchers in NCI. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. We, um, I just retyped my email. Hopefully that will be uh, Yeah, I think it was better. the captain. <laughs> um, if you want, if you, would you mind uh, just sending me a, a private message sure, to get your email and uh, we can, I'll just email you later. Um, okay. Thank you so much for attending our talk. Uh, we, one of our mission, uh, objectives, at least for me, I, I love outreach and I love uh, our platform. And I think it's a great resource for training. We use it um, for undergraduates to grow master students. So um, the more people we can get using our platform that are not usually as familiar with with bioinformatics is um, it's part of our goal. So. Okay, great. Well, we'll talk more later. Thank you so Thanks. much. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, with that, I think we're going to say goodbye for now. We'll see you next month. We'll have our next webinar will be in June 22nd. Um, and we'll be announcing who will be the speaker shortly. Thank you so much. <laughs>